I, I think the problem with the position at the moment is the absence of anything that looks remotely like leadership. Uh, it, we, we, what we've got now is the Jim Hacker School of Leadership, where he famously said, you know, I'm their leader, I must follow them. Um, now what we see in both major parties is policies being formed by reference to focus groups and news polls, um, typically in the marginal electorates, so that a relatively small number of members of the community are setting the government's policy for them. That doesn't strike me as good leadership, especially when the issue is one which goes to the heartland of proper conduct, you know, ethical behaviour. I think our political leaders try and shield themselves from the reality of what their policies do. Um, in fact, I've, um, at the Festival of Dangerous Ideas in Sydney recently, I put forward a couple of suggestions, one of which is that every federal parliamentarian should be required to spend a week in a detention centre as just an ordinary member of the detention centre population, and they should spend a full day not speaking to refugees but listening to refugees so that they get some understanding of what their circumstances are. Because frankly, it's quite difficult to meet people like that and not come away impressed with the fact that these are people who've suffered dreadfully, who are genuinely fearful of going back to be, you know, knocked off by the Taliban or whoever is in charge, um, and, and who've had the courage um, and the initiative to get here in an attempt to reach safety. I, I think there's a, a profound malaise in democracy in Australia and also in America and Britain at the moment. And it seems to start from the idea that major political parties now form their policies by looking at news polls, by looking at what um, people want in the key marginals. Um, and what it leads to is disenchantment with all of the major parties. Um, you know, I, I still do remember the time when you could predict pretty much what the Liberal Party's policy would be on this or that because you knew that they came from a certain base, they had certain founding principles and, and so you could figure out what they would think. And exactly the same with the Labor Party, except they had a different foundations and different principles and so you could work out that their policy would be different. Nowadays it's really hard to tell, it's really hard to predict what either of the major parties will think on any issue because frankly they don't look to their founding principles, they don't have any philosophical guidance. What they do is look to see what key people, what people will think in the marginal electorates. Now I don't think that's leadership at all. I think, and, uh, and it's weakening democracy quite seriously and it's a great pity that technology makes it so easy for them to find out what those people in those electorates want and then just to give it to them, calling that leadership, but it's not. Um, and unfortunately, if it goes on long enough, well then it has an effect on what the nation is about. You know, I, I do remember a time when Australia was generous and hospitable and easygoing and, um, and in many respects we're still like that. But our government doesn't behave like that. Our government's behaviour in relation to um, some marginalised groups, our government's behaviour in relation to boat people, uh, I think is sharply at odds with the character of the nation. And the very last thing any leader of any country should do is to degrade the reputation and character of the country uh, just for cheap political advantage for themselves. And that's what's going on here. And I suspect that's also happening in Britain and, and apparently in America as well. And it's, it's very sad. As James Thurber once said, you can't be king of the beasts if there aren't any. <laughs> and you know, it's difficult to say that you're a leader if no one is following. Um, on the other hand, I think that um, it, it, I, I, I think this country has enough decency left that if someone was prepared to stand up and say, 
I'm going to do this not because it's popular but because it's right then you might they might be surprised they might find more people following them than they expect um, because I suspect that most people still do hang on to some cherished myths about this country and it's just that there's no evidence for those myths being true anymore um, it would be a very fine thing I mean I, I remember uh, I remember you know my my parents generation who for whom uh, trying to do something to help people who are worse off than yourself was just instinctive it's what you did uh, there was no rule saying you've got to do it it's just what you did and they'd be shocked to think that um, a country would behave very badly towards um, groups who are in real trouble and of course we've shown over the decades that we can be generous and hospitable to people in trouble you know um, we're, we're a nation of we're a nation of people who've arrived here from other places um, I, I just wish I actually right right now what is it October 2011 I just wish Julia Gillard would face what looks to be the inevitable political trajectory she's on and stand up and say right here's what we're going to do and we're going to do it because we believe it's right and she could at least go out in a blaze of decency um, you know I, I admire Malcolm Turnbull who took standard principle uh, in relation to uh, um, uh, global warming and suffered the consequences it's a rare thing to see a parliamentarian do that in Australia these days um, now he may have some other faults I don't know but I did admire the fact that he took a standard principle and you do see that occasionally but it's so rare these days that um, you realize that leadership's harder to come by than it used to be When the Tampa episode happened, um, Kate, my wife, who's an artist and thinks like an artist, simply said, this is not the way Australia is. You know, we're, we're hospitable people. We don't turn people away uh, the way the government had done. And so she thought that a, a good symbol of that would be um, simply to offer a spare room to refugees, because so many houses have a spare room. So. We set up this organisation called Spare Rooms for Refugees, um, which ran for a number of years, um, managed to find accommodation for hundreds of refugees, um, and had the distinction of um, operating for years with no budget at all. We never raised money. I mean, you know, we, we paid our own expenses associated with it, but we never had to d um, sort of deflect ourselves from the past by going out fundraising and doing all of that sort of stuff. And then when I realised that I was getting lots and lots of requests to do um, pro bono cases for refugees, I knew that I couldn't handle them all. So I set up a group called Spare Lawyers for Refugees, modelled on the same idea. Um, and again, it ran for years without a budget, uh, provided rep representation for hundreds of refugees. Um, a large number of lawyers here and in the other states, all of whom were willing to pick up a case if they were available at the time and do it for nothing. And it was actually quite inspiring to see how many people were willing to chip in either with free accommodation or free legal help um, just because it needed to be done. It was really a marvellous thing to see. But also quite interesting to be involved in what is essentially charitable work, I guess. Um, but with no budget, with no, no money coming in, no money going out, no budget at all, no fundraising, just get down and do the job. Uh, it was very refreshing.